Hey, statisticians, I wanted to continue our discussion of the level of significance, but this time put the discussion of the level of significance in the, in the context of our um, previous understanding of a level of confidence. So when we were making confidence intervals back in the day, if you remember, we had a, a couple of common levels of confidence. Let me get a red marker. In terms of levels of confidence, we typically made confidence intervals using 90% confidence, sometimes 95% confidence, and sometimes at the extreme 99. I mean, we did other ones too, just for fun, but these were sort of our three main go-tos. So let's reflect on that. Then um, we were just talking about levels of significance. So we said in a level of significance, significance, that there was three main levels of significance we used. We used either 10% significance, say 5% significance, and 1% significance. And so just take first, take a second, look at those numbers and reflect on what you see and what relationship there might be between a level of confidence and significance. I put these numbers in this order for a reason, and that's because if I was to add these two numbers, it adds up to 100%. If I was to add these two numbers, it adds up to 100%. And if I was to add these two numbers, they, of course, add to 100%. And the key idea here is that in some sense, we could think of the level of significance as a kind of complement to the level of confidence. In other words, if I did one minus the level of significance, that would equal the level of confidence, right? So one minus 10% is 90%, uh, one minus 5% is 95, one minus one, uh, 100 minus 1% 1 is 99%. And so wh why do we see connections like that? Well, again, when we were making uh, confidence intervals, we, they were based on some normal curves um, or well, we actually saw some t-distributions and things like that as well too already. But let's just, just think about things in terms of a rough unimodal symmetric distribution. And uh, when you wanted to say 90% 90, 90 confidence, we knew that you had to go out about 1.645 standard deviations from the mean to get to 90% confidence. Well, how much was left on the edges? Well, if this is 90% in the middle, away from the, the middle of a distribution, then these two edges combined, right, uh, this guy plus this guy, they would add up to 10%, right? And the key idea is that this, this these little tails now, Right? could be considered a, uh, connected to a particular level of significance. This guy in the middle part, this is, has to do with a level of confidence. These two little tail parts have to do with a level of significance. And so when, here's the question, when would the level of significance really be the, the complement to a level of confidence? Well, it had to be in a situation where the level of significance cared about two tails, right? Um, and when does the level of significance care about two tails? Well, when we had an alternative hypothesis, HA, which was something like, I don't know, that the mu is not equal to some number K, whenever we had a two-tail test. And so what the... This fact that one minus the level of significance is associated with the level of confidence it only applies when we have a two-tailed test, right? not if we only have a one-tailed test. And we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with one-tailed tests in just a second. Um, but the, uh, in fact, we'll see that if you made, say, a 90% confidence interval, that should be consistent with the results of a test at 10% significance virtually every time. There is a very, very small caveat that there may be situations where they just don't match up. Um, it has to do with how we use a standard error versus a standard deviation from a population sometimes. But regardless, in general, uh, a two-tailed test would give you uh, the uh, consistent results with whatever you would get if a 90% confidence interval if you're trying to evaluate a set of hypotheses. Um, that, of course, would work for 95% and 5% and 99 and 1%. So, um, what happens, though, if we only had a one-tailed test? Well, let's think about what these tails are, right? So if, if, this, if this is 90% in the middle and this uh, is 10% on, uh, on the edges, how much are each of the tails? Well, this tail would be, say, 5%, and this tail over here would be 5%. And so what we'll actually see is that a 90% confidence interval would be consistent with a two-tailed test, a two-tailed test when alpha was 0.1, but it'll only be consistent with a one-tailed test if alpha is what one of the tails are, like 0.05, right? Well, let's, let's, let's see that uh, a little bit in an example, just to help us think about it. Um, let's go back to this guy again. Remember when we were, uh, we keep going back to the same example over and over and over, but that's all right. When our friend who had this die that was greatly improved his probability of rolling a six compared to a fair die. And, um, he did 80 rolls, got uh, at six 19 times. We ended up rejecting the null hypothesis because our p-value was uh, 0.46, right? And um, but 
in a, in a quiz, when we actually first saw this example, I had asked you, instead of doing any type of level of significance, I asked you to create a confidence interval at 95% confidence, right? And um, that says, oh my gosh, my handwriting. Um, that says 95% confidence. In fact, we could do that right now if we wanted to do a 95% confidence interval. And if I just did it quickly in my calculator, I could go to um, a uh, one prop Z int. Uh, where is it? There I go, option A, and I could, ooh, I already have it in. 19 uh, successes, 80 trials, 95% confidence. If I just calculated this guy quick on the fly, we saw that the confidence interval was from 0.14425 to, uh, let's see here, 0.33075. And so when we use this, this confidence interval to evaluate the friend's claim, we said, does this confidence interval give us significant evidence to reject the null hypothesis? And, and, and when we use the confidence interval with 95% confidence, we, we failed to reject because we saw one sixth boom is absolutely in this interval. P equals one sixth was here. And so our 95% confidence interval actually caused us to fail to reject. Now, how is that consistent with the significance test? Here, we did a 5% level of significance and got a p-value of 4.6%. But here we did a 95% confidence interval and we failed to reject. Here we rejected and here we failed to reject. Why aren't these results the same? Ah, remember what I just said. I said that the, uh, the a confidence interval will be consistent with uh, the, the level of significance when it's a two-tailed test. At a two-tailed test, a 90% confidence interval should give us the same result as a 10% level of significance. Was this a two-tailed test? It was not. Remember, we had P was greater than one-sixth. And so in order for us to see why uh, it, we made one decision here and a different decision here, we need to realize that actually when we had a 95% confidence interval, our level of significance is not what we thought it was, right? You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, right? Um, think about it. 95% requires that we shade in 95% here in the middle and thinking about the critical value to make our confidence interval. Well, what are the tails in a 95% confidence interval? Well, we know the sum of the two tails is 5%, right? And so each of these tails has to be 2.5%. So actually, this 95% confidence interval was the same thing as a level of significance where alpha is 0.025. So when we were evaluating just the right tail here, it's really just this tail right there that becomes meaningful for me in thinking about what the, what, what the level of significance that would be associated with this 95% level of confidence. And so why do we have inconsistent results? Well, it's because we had a different level of significance. If our p-value was 4.6% and alpha was 0.25, would we reject the null hypothesis? I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Once again, we would fail to reject, right? And so it makes perfect sense that we failed to reject with our confidence interval in this particular sense because we had an alpha that was more demanding than the alpha we actually used set at 5%. So here's a question. What would have been the appropriate confidence interval to create if we wanted to have a 5% level of significance, right? What should have been the correct confidence interval? Well, um, let's, let's draw, right? That we know that if we drew a normal curve and we had a right tail test so that this was 5% associated with our particular alpha, then if I want to know the appropriate level of confidence associated with that, I could say, well, uh, that's kind of like a two-tailed test, and so I should have uh, drawn another tail over here and that, where that's 5%. And what percent would be left in the middle now? Well, this middle part would be 90%. Ah, that's just like what I said here. Remember, we said that a 90% uh, level of confidence is associated with a 10% level of significance for a two-tailed test, but actually a 5% level of significance for a one-tailed test. And so if I wanted to find a confidence interval that should give me a, a consistent result with this 5% level of significance, it should have been a 90% confidence interval. Let's put it to the test. Let's take out our calculator. Um, we're going to do the one prop Z int again. I'll go to tests. Uh, alpha A, I'll do 19 successes eighty um, in 80 trials, but I'll change my level of confidence, confidence to 0.90, I'll calculate and shazam. What do we see here? We see 
0.159 and 0.31576. Uh, is P hat is P in this situation? Uh, wait a second. It's in there, isn't it? Um, ooh, did I just lie to you about everything? Um, here, here's where another element comes in that becomes important. Um, and this is why I said that these, uh, levels of confidence are only mostly going to be consistent with levels of significance. The key idea here is that remember when we made our confidence interval, we used the standard error of P hat, which meant we used the square root of P hat times one minus P hat over N, right? While when we made it, our, did our significance test, we actually used P in our calculation for the standard deviation, right? And so, boom, 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 we had uh, the standard deviation of P at was the square root of P times one minus P over N. And in this case, there's gonna be some discrepancy between uh, the, the calculation we get with P at and the calculation we get with P. And in this situation then, um, we have to realize that sometimes things work out a little bit differently. Um, that this particular standard error is gonna be larger than this. Uh, so for instance, when I calculate, uh, let me show you here real quick, uh, the square root of, uh, what was it, 19 divided by 80 times, what is that, 61 divided by 80 divided by 80, uh, we got that. When I did one, oops, oops, the square root of one six times five six divided by 80, we got that. Notice that there's actually a 0.6% uh, uh, approximately a 0.6% difference um, between these guys. If I just subtract them, boom. Oops, let me hit the minus sign first. Boom, and enter uh, about a 0.6% um, difference. And that actually makes it a little bit of a difference when we compare the confidence interval to the significance test. And so while I'll say in general, a 90 um, a 90% level of confidence, confidence interval should be consistent with the 10% level of significance. It's not all the time. And even in this example we saw here, it wasn't perfect. But in general, those are the kinds of ideas that we have. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, we'll see some more examples and some more videos where we think about levels of significance and errors and junk like that later on. Um, have a beautiful day. Giddy up.